What would your life be like if stress was not an issue for you? If you were to respond in every single situation with your entire brain and without your body going or your mind closing down, shutting off, if you had access to every single part of you and your physiology was supporting you, what would that be like? Just stop for a second and think about that. <sighs> yeah, medical research suggests that 90% of all illness and disease is stress related. So what does that tell us? Well, we have this mind that is made of the conscious mind, which is 5% of what we use. And everything else, 95% is below our level of awareness, is controlled in the subconscious mind. And if we have experienced any type of stressor or trauma or difficult event in the past, we have this filter called the reticular activating system that is constantly scanning the environment for threats. And it's looking, does this remind me of anything that I've ever experienced that was difficult before? And the second it finds anything. So if you experience something really stressful and it was a sunny day, every time there's a sunny day, your subconscious mind is saying, okay, we gotta prepare. This is it, this is it. And it does not have access to past, present, future. So everything it experiences when it's reliving a traumatic event, it thinks it's happening right now. So your body mobilizes to fight, to run, or to hide. And in 99% of the cases, that's not an appropriate response or reaction to what is happening in the world, right? Like if your boss says, oh my gosh, I need to see you. Are you going to run away? Are you gonna fight him or her? Or are you gonna hide under your desk? Probably not. So what happens is your body stores that stress in your veins, arteries, in your cells. And it just becomes another traumatic thing or another difficult event that your subconscious mind adds to its evidence that we don't live in a safe world or whatever belief you're believing, it has found evidence to support. So if you are new to me, my name is Karen Seltz. This is Irresistible You, Ignite Your Passion and Purpose. This show is for women that are ready to step into their calling, that are ready to examine their subconscious beliefs, bring them up to the surface so they can heal them. And most of the women that watch this show have this deeper calling and they are like grappling with it. They're like, oh, should I do it? Should I not? Should I continue to be safe? But there's something that keeps urging them forward. There's a voice that keeps getting louder and louder. And what I do is I teach spirituality and mindset mainly to people like that. My dog's having a nightmare. <laughs> Lola, it's okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear her or if the background noise is uh, set appropriately. Anyway, a little bit about me. I have a lot of education because I never felt like I was enough. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I had shiny object syndrome. Every time there was a, a class or a course that I thought was interesting, I'd be like, oh yeah, that's amazing. I need to learn that and I need to learn that. And the reason was I felt like I was lacking and I felt this need to prove that I was smart enough, that I had enough to offer, that I was worth listening to. So I collected these things and I never used most of them I just didn't, but I collected them to the kind of like a security blanket. So it was also a clever way for the ego to get me to procrastinate. So if you're caught in that trap, I call it seek and not find where you're like constantly looking for the next bright thing to run from your calling or to stay safe, really, then I can relate. I can indeed relate. But one of these things has really served me, one of these certifications, and it took me many years to get this, and I traveled all over the country 
to wherever I could find these classes because there were certain ones that I needed to get to be certified. And this thing is called Brain Gym. It's gym like gymnasium. And it is this amazing system of 26 movements that are designed specifically to rewire the brain. And they're very, very simple. It was designed by a man who had dyslexia growing up, felt like he was stupid, like there was something wrong with him. And he just realized his brain didn't work the same way as everybody else's. And what if he could rewire it? So he came up with a system to rewire the brain. What's beautiful about this is it also incorporates this field of study called Touch for Health, which incorporates all of the Chinese medicine that acupuncture is based on, which is the meridians, which is how the way the energy flows in the body. And it's super, super cool. And I'm going to show you some of those tonight. There have been multiple studies done that if you get into some of these postures immediately after a traumatic event, that your body will not store that memory in, in your body, in your cells, in your brain. It just releases it. So it's one fewer thing to be triggered by, which is nice, <laughs> I think. And taken together, you can actually use these movements to balance your brain and to rewire it for brand new habits, which is at a much larger scale than what we're doing here today. But I wanted to show you some of these things because who doesn't have stressful things come up? What if you could get into a posture? What if you could control your breathing, slow down the breathing? When we slow down the breathing, our brain waves slow down. Yes, I'm gonna get a little nerdy on you, but that's okay. You got this, you're smart. So when we are in normal day-to-day, -day, we are functioning, we're doing our jobs, we are in what's called low beta wave brain wave pattern. Now low beta is, you know, it's pretty fast. The, it's going pretty quickly. When we start to relax, we go, get into a meditative state or a trance, even when we're watching television or listening to somebody tell a story, our brain waves slow down and we get into an alpha state. And in the alpha state, we are more suggestible. So if you go ever go for a hypnosis situation, I mean, not situation, but a, a process, an appointment, you will be in an alpha state, most likely. If you go deep, deep, you will go into theta. And theta is that state between dreaming and asleep. So it's kind of like, oh, I kind of am aware, but my you start to kind of dream. And you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. And your mind is kind of going through some things, but you're in and out of consciousness. And then when you're in deep sleep, that your brain waves slow it even further, and that's delta. Well, beta, remember, was the faster one. When we get stressed out, we go into high beta. When that happens, our brain waves are going do, 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 do. And usually the different parts of the brain, like, you know, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, for example, where your emotions are stored, they are not doing this together. If you look at a brain scan, the waves are and they're crashing. And that is called incoherence. Your heartbeat is probably erratic as well. When you can slow down the breathing, the heart rate naturally slows down and the brain waves slow down. So even being conscious, like if you start to get stressed out and you're breathing shallowly up here in your chest, you can hear it, right? You can feel it <laughs> and you can see it. Your shoulders might be rising. You can feel it. There are very predictable things that happen before a panic attack. In fact, they can be predicted an entire hour before they occur. And everybody I know that's ever had one will say, well, it just came on instantly. I was fine. And then all of a sudden, boom, it was like hyperventilating and the room was closing in. And But if you look at your physiology, it's reacting to something usually that happened about an hour prior and it's below your level of consciousness. So when you feel the effects of stress start to, to kick in, or even before that, 
you can do some of the things I'm going to show you. The first thing is, <laughs> this is hilarious. All right, so this was invented in the 70s before this term meant anything. So in brain gym, this is called hookups. I call it whole brain posture because it is integrating all of the meridians of the body, which is the way that energy flows, Chinese medicine. And it is integrating all like the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain. It's integrating the front and the back of the brain, the top and the bottom of the brain. It's doing all that at once. And it's super, super simple. So I wanna talk a little bit about meridians. So in Chinese medicine, there are 14 main meridians. Each one has a, an organ system that it's responsible for. For example, the large intestine meridian. And they each have an issue. So I love the large intestine meridian because it's, it's a really simple metaphor for life. The, the large intestine meridian is responsible for letting go. Now think about what it does. It lets go of what no longer serves you, the waste. But when there's a blockage in it, you hold on to that waste. You get constipated. Also, you might hold on to issues and you get into a fight with your partner. You're like, remember 10 years ago when you did this? That could simply be a blockage in your large intestine meridian. When it is flowing, you are more likely to let those issues go. And if there is an imbalance the other direction, you might have IBS where everything's going. People can walk all over you because you, you can't hold on to anything and you can't stand up for yourself. So 12 of the body's 14 main meridians begin or end in the fingers and toes. And in this first posture, hookups, whole brain posture that I'm gonna show you, you are taking your energy and instead of it starting and stopping, you're going to make a figure eight with 12 of those 14 meridians. So do this with me. You're gonna, you can do it seated or standing up. I like to stand because it's easier for me. You're gonna cross one foot over the other. So if you're sitting, that's fine. You can just cross them like this. So your ankles are crossed. And if you're standing, obviously your feet are flat on the ground. Then you're going to take your hands in front of you with your thumbs facing downward. Cross the hands, intertwine the fingers, and then simply fold them in to your heart. Now, it's best if you can close your eyes, if you feel comfortable doing that, you don't have to. And hold on one second because I want to show you one more thing. The other two meridians keep staying in this position. I'm going to show you the other two. One is called the central meridian, and it starts in the perineum, which is essentially the crotch, and it runs up and it ends just below your bottom lip. The other one is called the governing meridian, which also starts in the perineum, but it goes up your back and it ends above the upper lip. We are going to connect to those, stay in this position, and you're going to connect to those with your tongue. So on the inhale, you're going to raise your tongue up to the roof of your mouth, just behind your upper teeth. So breathe in. And then exhale and lower the tongue down behind your bottom teeth, just where it normally goes. So as you breathe in, the tongue goes up to the roof of your mouth, right behind your upper teeth. And then just slowly relax the tongue down and exhale the air out. Now the 12 meridians that I mentioned that begin or end in the fingers and toes, there is a figure eight going on. So just stay in that position and the energy will start to flow. Most people will immediately feel a relaxation take place. If you get into a car accident or almost get into a car accident, get into this position as quickly as possible. It will change your physiology almost immediately. Within two minutes, it will change. I have had panic attacks in the past, and when I felt one coming on last time, it was many, many years ago, I simply got in this position and closed my eyes. I laid down. If you're doing this lying down, it's good to put some pillows under your elbows because it gets kind of uncomfortable, or you can just cross like a corpse, <laughs> Dracula pose. <laughs> and it calmed me down. I never had the panic attack. My body's like, it's okay. 
because the breath is becoming deliberate because you're focusing, you know, tongue up on the inhale, tongue down on the exhale, and you're connecting all those meridians together. Now, after you do this, I do it until I feel very calm. The next part of it, there are two parts. So that was part A, is to uncross your feet so they're just normal, flat on the ground or, yeah, flat on the ground whether you're standing or in a chair. And then you uncross your hands and then touch your fingertips gently together. You can continue the breathing with the tongue up on the inhale and down on the exhale. And I like to touch my fingers very, very lightly together. And sometimes you can feel the energy flowing between them. And I picture my brain in here in between my fingers. And I picture it working and being very calm and all the different components of the brain, all the different parts talking to one another, synchronized. If you saw my brain on a scan, it would look like this, at least in my imagination, right? Because our intention is so powerful. And if we are intending that our brain be synchronized and that our body release the stress, that is what will happen. So that is my favorite brain gym posture for releasing stress. There are some other ones. I'm gonna show you another one that is called positive points. And this is a neurovascular holding point. Neurovascular simply means it's on the head. And for this one, I like to take two fingers and we're gonna gently put them, now I say this for the guys, between the eyebrows and the natural hairline, there are these little dents and you can sort of feel them. And you can feel these pulses, you can feel the blood like so when you feel that, those pulses, sometimes they're not beating together when you first start. You want to just gently touch there and breathe slowly. It's good to close your eyes too. And if it feels good, you can gently pull your fingers apart, just really gently. You're not tugging the skin, you're just like barely pulling them apart. And you want to hold this again until you feel calm and you should also feel that beating begin to synchronize so if it was going or, or whatever it was doing it will start beating together boom 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 and when you feel that you can hold it for as long as it feels good or you can simply relax there are some things that i love to do too with breath one of the things that really helps me to slow down my breath is called alternate nostril breathing. I learned it in Kundalini yoga. I don't know where it comes from. I just know that it works. At one point I wrote this little ebook on breathing and alternate nostril breathing does so many good things for us. One, one thing is you can't get as much air in very quickly. So it forces you to slow your breathing down, which remember, slows down the heart rate. It also slows down the brain waves. So it takes you from high beta to low beta and maybe even to alpha. And again, it's up to you. If you feel comfortable, I recommend doing it with your eyes closed. If you don't, then don't. Just, just have a soft gaze, maybe at the floor or at one single point. The Buddhist tradition, they like to do a candle flame. So they'll just have their eyes kind of closed a little bit and they'll stare at a candle flame. So alternate nostril breathing. You're gonna close one nostril. I'm gonna sound really good. <laughs> you're gonna close the nostril with your thumb and you're gonna breathe in through the one that's open. So let's do that. Then you're gonna close the one that was open and you're gonna breathe out the other one. Then you're gonna breathe in that one and then close it and then breathe out the other one. Breathe in the other one, or that one, <laughs> and then close it and breathe out. So a normal breath cycle is you breathe in and you breathe out. With alternate nostril breathing, 
you're breathing out through one nostril and then in. So every time you inhale, you're going to switch nostrils. So you're switching in the middle of the breath. So that makes it easier for me to remember because as you exhale, that's one breath, right? So this one, you're going to switch nostrils after you inhale. So you're going to be in the middle of a cycle. So I'm going to inhale on this one and close it and then exhale. And inhale. Close it. Exhale. There's another way to do this that also incorporates the third eye. So if you want, you can rest your middle finger on your third eye and then do it. You can't see me though, so. So if you want to, some people really like that because then it gets them to focus inward. But try that out, let me know how it feels because I think it, you'll really notice a difference in your physiology. There are lots of ways you can use your breath. In Brain Gym, your breath is associated with personal power. When we are little, usually, and we want to avoid detection, a lot of times we'll hold our breath. <gasps> if I hold my breath, nobody will see me and they won't know that I just stole a cookie. Well, that gets set in our reflexes. And every time we're stressed out, many of us will hold our breath. Then that leads to these feelings of powerlessness. So notice if you're stressed out, the first thing, am I breathing? <sighs> the other thing that I learned in Kundalini Yoga is that as Americans, we use such a tiny percentage of our lung capacity. So practice, practice breathing longer. There is an exercise in Kundalini, it's called one breath per minute. <laughs> and this takes a while to work up to. I can do it some days, not all days. But here's the concept. You breathe in for 20 seconds. Think about that. I mean, I don't know if you know how long that is, but time it. 20 seconds in, you hold it for 20 seconds, and then you exhale for 20 seconds. When I first tried this, I'm like, oh, no way. So I did 10, 10, and 10, and then I built up. And now I have a ginormous lung capacity. <laughs> it's really big. I do yoga now and we do some breathing where it's audible, you can hear. And I am often the only one still exhaling at the end because I've taken in so much air because I've practiced it for 10 years. So start practicing expanding your lung capacity. Lungs are associated with self-worth. Interesting, right? in Chinese medicine. So think about, you know, if you feel unworthy, how are you treating your lungs? Are you breathing shallowly? Are you breathing slowly and deeply? Are you filling them up? Are you loving your lungs? Are you breathing polluted air? Are you smoking? Um, and there's no judgment on any of that at all, because we all gravitate towards things that made us feel better at one time or another. That is how the subconscious mind works. And if it worked once, it's like, well, it worked once. I'm going to try that again. And then we build these patterns. That's how addictions start. You know, if we feel really bad, we're in pain and we take a drug and it makes us not be in pain anymore, we keep returning to it and we build these habit loops. So even when it no longer serves us, when the drug doesn't make us feel better anymore, we still have the habit loop. So it's really becomes like this mind kerfuffle <laughs> where we're like, why am I doing that? It makes no sense. It doesn't even make me feel better. It's not your fault. It's the subconscious mind. It is wired for more of the same. So that's where we get to come in and interrupt and like, well, that's not working. Let's try something else. Let's try breathing. I've told this before, but somewhere in my forties, I bought a pack of cigarettes. I don't know. It makes no sense. And I used to, when I would feel like really overwhelmed, I was probably a new single parent. That's why I would do like take two or three drags of a cigarette and it would calm me down. It'd be like, oh. what I realized was it was slowing down my breathing. 
yeah, there was the nicotine or whatever, but if I was feeling stressed and overwhelmed, if I just slowed down my breathing, like on a cigarette, you can't take in that much air at once, right? It slows down the breathing, just like the alternate nostril breathing. If I were to do that, I didn't want the cigarette anymore. And it was a ridiculous habit for me to have anyway, two or three drags <laughs> every three weeks. That's what, that was my habit. But if you give your body what it really wants, in my case, it was oxygen. It was slowing down, calming down the nervous system. And you become conscious, like, why am I doing that? Okay, why do I want the ice cream? What is it that I don't want to feel? Or what is it that I do want to feel? You know, I don't want to feel these emotions and I do want to feel pleasure. So get conscious about that because there's always stuff running and be gentle with yourself. We all have it. We all do. No matter how much work we've done, <laughs> we still have the stuff and we have the remnants of it. It's like we're just willing to work on what we can when we are ready to do it. That's it. So I really hope this was supportive for you to release your stress. So let's go over it again. We have hookups or whole brain posture, which is this, bringing the tongue up on the inhale, right behind your upper teeth and down on the exhale. Your feet are also crossed. Then we had positive points and we had alternate nostril breathing. I know a bunch of these, but those are my favorites. So let me know, please comment. And if you like this video, please like it. Comment and let me know which one's your favorite and how it worked for you. Thank you so much for watching Irresistible You, Ignite Your Passion and Purpose. I'm Karen Seltz, thank you.